Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to my world. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer himself. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Jeff, how are you, man? Conrad Thompson. How are you doing today, man? I'm, I'm pretty excited about this episode. These were some really fun times in my career. But uh, as my world rolls along, we continue on this roller coaster ride and all kinds of things Titans and holding up vents and bash at the beach and. I was looking at the YouTube channel the other day, Conrad, and I was just kind of amazed at, uh, what are we mid July and we cranked up in may. So we're, what are we not even three months? There is a awful lot of content on the, my world, uh, YouTube channel. There is go click subscribe and uh, tell your friends. Our YouTube channel is the easiest way to introduce your wrestling friends and family to, uh, all that we're doing here on my world. Lots of little, uh, sample sizes, if you will. Next week, we're going to be bouncing all over the place for ask Jeff anything during the month of August. We're going to hit some big stories, new blood rising in 2000. Yes. A WCW 2000 topic coming your way in two weeks. We'll hit SummerSlam 98 and 99, just in time for this year's SummerSlam. And then a story behind the story for hard justice, 2006. And, uh, there's a lot of meat on the bone on that one. A little spoiler for you, but next week it's ask Jeff anything. And that's where we throw you guys the keys to the show. You really do get to ask Jeff anything you want. You can do that right now on Twitter. Uh, so if you haven't already go follow us there, but today we're talking about, ain't I great Jeff's WWF debut. We're going to get real granular here because we're not only going to talk about your debut vignettes, but your first TV matches and all the comings and goings that happened with the WWF before all of that happened. And the first time I think you interacted with the WWF is something we touched on in our remembering Owen episode. It's August 8th, 1992 at a USWA show in Memphis. You cut a promo on the WWF being in town the next night at the pyramid saying, this is your territory. And this is really the beginning of Jerry Lawler, your dad and the USWA working with the WWF. And you're sitting ringside at an event at the pyramid, August 9th, 1992. During that show, you hop the rail and challenge any WWF wrestler, which of course is later answered by intercontinental champion at the time, Bret Hart, a lot to unpack here, but how did this come to be? And how excited were you to be in this spot? You know, uh, as you can imagine, um, so this is 92, uh, funny summer, the summer of no worries, but it wasn't a summer of no worries back then, but it was, uh, I remember, uh, a, a little, uh, I remember arriving at, uh, arriving at the pyramid, uh, I wore a, a suit and tie and I was burning up, uh, out in the parking lot waiting to figure out cause we were going in the back, but going to be sitting on the front row. But, uh, you know, during this time, that was when my father and Vince were having those Sunday afternoon conversations and. You know, I wasn't uh, privy to those, but I was mainly mainly working. You know, if if not seven days a week, six week days a week, every week in the territory. So on Sundays, sometimes I would make my rounds to the in laws or to my dad's house. But my dad would always be on the phone, um, and a lot of Sundays it would be with Vince. And so 
as uh, things were, you know, the territory wasn't good. Uh, anybody could see that uh, mania was here to stay. You know, it, by, it, by this time, it was mania six, seven, eight, something along those lines. Um, WCW had now, uh, you know, fully gone from the NWA. Well, I mean, you know, they, they, the things were, there were two major organizations. I'll say that. So the territory days uh, were way way behind us and the texas thing um had fallen apart by this time uh so uh, here we were and getting the opportunity uh with the wwf and brett and all the big stars and uh, i was very excited uh to see where this took us i mean it, it was I don't say going by the seat of our pants, but nothing was planned for in advance. It's, Hey, they're coming to Memphis. They're running a live event. Uh, let's recognize the local promotion. Let's, you know, basically just do a little teaser. We were going to get some dates on, if not Brett, other guys. And so, uh, I was glad to be a part of it. My favorite thing I discovered in doing research for this show is that Wade Keller of the torch reached out to Jerry Lawler about this angle. And Lawler claimed to know nothing about it. <laughs> I love Jerry. Uh, what was it like being in the ring with Brett that night? I mean, this is your first time in, a, as far as I know, in a WWF ring working with arguably the best there is the best there was the best there ever will be. And, you know, I know it's a, it's a business and it's a show, but you take a lot of pride in what you do between those ropes. And this is a guy who was really regarded as being one of the best in the world. I'm curious. I'm, I'm sure you were at least curious. What would that be like? How would you measure up? Because there were some bright lights in the world wrestling federation. I, you know, a couple of memories that come to mind is I remember how, how hard the WWF ring was at the time, just, yeah. just the, the whole structure of it. Uh, but also I had gone to Memphis every Monday for at this point, five or six years actively in my career. And then prior to that, you know, going as a referee and then going to matches and hanging out with my dad, just all that. But that was at the mid South Coliseum. And so this was the new building, uh, the pyramid. And so just having an event in that building was new. It was the first time that I'd sort of seen those surroundings. Um, it, that, 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 that I, I don't say call me all car, but it just that, that was different. And then getting in the ring with Brett, um, you know, at that, I was young, dumb, naive, but no, I was really, um, confident in, in my ability. And, and, you know, I was on top quote unquote in Memphis, uh, but, but this was the WWF. So, but still it was like, they're coming in our backyard and that was somewhat of the storyline, not, I don't want to say too far that we already had a storyline, but that was the premise. Um, and so I felt real good about it and the people responded well. I remember, uh, thinking now this is the WWF crowd. Are they, you know, just, uh, uh, let me say this. I remember overhearing my dad's conversations, like, look, wrestling fans in Memphis, cause, uh, um, uh, not bash at the beach. What was the, uh, WCW summer tour that used to come through with David Allen co and dusty put together. Right 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 right. Yeah. You know, that, that had come through Memphis. Uh, so when other promotions had come in, they didn't always have really good success in Memphis, uh, because WMC was so strong and the territory was built and, and specifically Lawler and, 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 and our brand of wrestling was so strong, but, um, it was a, it was a really cool feeling to, uh, get the, just to experience it. So we should mention that, uh, Brett's going to go on to later lose the intercontinental championship at Wembley stadium and that classic match with the British bulldog. But the plan was always for you guys to work some in Memphis, right? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So, so, you know, and we didn't know what it was going to look like. Those guys were traveling, excuse me, traveling all over the world. Uh, so but, you know, schedules, but, uh, we were going to get some dates. Um, that was the, uh, sort of the understanding of the agreement, get some dates with some top guys. We should mention that match happened on the ninth with you and Brett. And on the 11th, it's reported that, uh, in the torch, there's some TV tapings going down and you and your dad are going to attend and you're trying to get the USWA to help promote shows down here in the South and possibly even use the USWA as a feeder league of sorts. Of course, this is like a precursor for what is going to become developmental. Do you remember this meeting? Were you involved 
Uh, I mean, were you at the table with uh, your dad and Vince when this is happening? No, it's a lot of it done by phone calls. Lots of, um, but just sort of to, to give context, to everything is that, um, you know, in Memphis, we had a young Steve Austin, an undertaker. Um, I mean, we could go on and on with the list of talent that had come through. We needed, uh, talent desperately, specifically we needed opponents for Lawler and the talent. And this is where it's, it's sort of hard to, to, to understand because independent wrestling really wasn't a thing. And Kansas city had dried up and Texas had dried up. All the territories had basically dried up and we don't have really independent wrestling. It's like, where's this talent going to come from? So the agreement was, we still had our infrastructure guys weren't making any money, but we were running towns weekly. Still, we had a place for, for guys that could get seasoned and learn, you know, there wasn't a performance center. Uh, there, there wasn't any developmental territories, uh, OVW wasn't a thing. So uh, that was my understanding. And that was the conversations between my father and Vince where we'll be this without calling it a developmental territory. If you'll give us some top stars, we'll develop talent. And that was the premise of, of the direction we were hoping to head. I am, um, interested to hear from your perspective. I mean, obviously your dad wants to be in business with Vince McMahon, but you're still a young buck. You're not exactly a, a wrestling executive. You're, you're angling to be a superstar. Were you having conversations with your dad about, Hey dad, uh, are we going to try to work it out where I can go work for Vince? And, and I think we touched on this, but around 90, 91, WCW, uh, Crockett, uh, the old man had, you know, they had said, Hey, we got a spot for him. And, and my dad turned it down without me really even knowing he turned it down. Do you think I, it was dusty who would have did that? Because, uh, you, know, you know, definitely, uh, yes. I, I'm now I found that out later, but yeah. yes, the, the short answer is because Dustin had come through Texas, right? Yes. So, so I, I didn't know it at the time, but dusty was definitely, um, uh, me and him, you know, later now we're going much later in the TNA days, but in those days, uh, this is 10 years prior. Yes. Dusty, uh, had wanted me, uh, to come to work for WCW. They were always bringing in new talent. Uh, so yeah. How did you find out your dad turned it down? He told me, <laughs> he told me, uh, on a bus ride coming back from, uh, Dallas, um, he just, how does, that, how does that come up? Oh, Jeff, I forgot to mention, uh, I passed on your big break. No, I yeah, basically, and you know, <laughs> oh boy, you, <laughs> this ain't granular, but this is getting into the, the, the personal side of things that, you know, I had to keep a poker face on and like, okay, did he just tell me? And in my mind, if you remember back in those days, it was what's WCW paying you 52, 104, 156. <laughs> and it was a 156 rough. And I'm like, what? So I wasn't a part of that conversation, but you know, I'm making certainly a thousand bucks. A, not a hell no, 750 bucks a week, you know, so maybe 500 bucks a week plus pictures and all that. But so as you're a, making like 40 grand a year, probably. Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 you know, in the pictures, my, my, my merch is what always carried me in the territory days always. Um, but that that's as a young 20 year old man say, okay, he turned down a job and I was going to be making more money. That didn't really sit well, but you know, his logic was, um, once you stretch, you know, once you step foot on a, a national stage, better be ready. And there were some case studies. I, I'd have to really think that guys that just got to, WCW or the WWF that weren't ready and you could tell it, they, they were so green. Yeah. Uh, so, so I took that to heart and said, okay, I didn't really like it probably, but no, I did you know, I, okay. Need to have a little bit more patience. Uh, so that's the WCW fast forward, the WWF. When this happened, I was, look, I, I grew up, uh, we, we've, we've referenced this, you know, the manias and the summer slams and macho man, Randy Savage and Ricky steamboat. And, Mr. Perfect and Rowdy Roddy Piper. And it goes without saying Hulk and all the giants, where there's earthquake or Kamala, you know, all the, the monster heels. Um, I, I, I loved it. I absolutely. You know, I was, a, I still am a wrestling junkie. 
Uh, but, but, you know, getting that opportunity to finally stand in a ring with Bret Hart and know that, okay, we're going to, we could be working some kind of developmental deal between the territory and, and WWF. And that's my, you know, I didn't have any ownership. So that's my dad's business. Me as a talent, I'm going a long way around to say, Capone Conrad, you damn right. I was ready to get on the WWF. I get it. It's a wrestling podcast, but he's saving us money on our mortgage. Do you really trust this process? The reviews don't lie. Five-star review after five-star review. We make it fast. We make it easy. And it's no cost or obligation. Give us a shot to earn your business. I'm telling you, you'll be glad you did, especially if you like keeping more of your own money. You don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket. So what are you waiting for? Hurry to savewithconrad.com. Well, two things I want to ask about one, I asked about that, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners were probably thinking, well, duh, Conrad, what a dumb question. But the reality is you could have gone the other way. You could have said, no, I want to get this developmental thing going. And you know, my dad's, uh, getting up there in age, maybe this can be my business. There's a lot of sons who aspire to inherit the family business. And then there's other folks who want to sort of get out and carve their own path. And you didn't exactly say, I just think I'll go be an engineer. You said, I'm going to get into my dad's business. And of course your dad started as a wrestler, but really most people think of Jerry Jarrett as a promoter and a businessman and an owner. And I just wanted to know from your perspective, your aspiration here in 92 is not to necessarily own a territory. It's to be a top guy in the business, right? For sure. As my shirt currently says that I have. A hundred percent. So w- when we were talking about the whole WCW opportunity and, and he lowers the boom on you on this bus ride back that, oh yeah, I passed on that opportunity for you. Uh, just to add some, some context to that at the time. And I know this sounds silly, but I want everybody to understand. You just said it. You're 20 years old. Are you living on your own? Are you living at dad's house? What's that look like? I could get into a story, but I'd been in the business Conrad, so I broke in in April. So it was um, in the summer because my my girlfriend was obviously out of school, uh, who I later married. But anyway, I came in one night late from the town to her house and got in, uh, I don't know, three or four. And he had woke up in the middle of the night, but before I got home and he wasn't happy. I wasn't home because he knew the roads and knew the towns. And again, you know, pre-cell phones. Okay. He's not home. You begin to wonder, you know, there's been accidents in the, you know, Sam Bass years and years ago died of a car wreck. There's been accidents. So as a dad, he started, you know, pacing the floor, like where the hell, you know, where is this kid? Well, he was furious when I got home because he had gone back to bed, but heard me come in the next day he woke up and he said, this little situation is over. (laughs) <laughs> that literally, uh, you know, he didn't take my bags and throw me out, but I, I think I had a week or two, uh, or so, and probably stretched to a month or whatever, but I was out, uh, if you're in this business. So I got a condo, uh, close, you know, back toward Nashville, not Hendersonville. Is this the infamous, uh, Jarrett mansion? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's that, that was uh yeah, that, that, those were the last few days I spent that, uh, as my home. So let's, um, let's also talk about, you know, when, when he makes that pass for you, does he explain Jeff, you're just not ready or something like that? Yeah. I mean, d- d- we would have those, I don't say intellectual conversations, but he would, I mean, every opportunity and sometimes as a 20 something year old kid, you're like, geez, but uh, Hey guys, uh, Conrad, uh, full disclosure here. This is where I get my long winded cheese. I mean, he would talk <laughs> in depth about certain things, but you know, when I look back on it, I'm grateful because he yeah. was trying to teach me a lot, like, like the, 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 some real, c- the cores of the business and Conrad, not, not to, uh, uh, sidebar, but I've gotten some calls from guys. I'll say in their thirties, I'll leave them, uh, I'll leave, but they've asked me like, Jeff, you, you were really in some points in your podcast, you're teaching me some things that I had no idea about in, in the business of wrestling. Uh, so, uh, but I, I got that from old man and those were the kind of conversations that he, you know, he had the mindset of, like I said, once you step onto a national stage, don't learn your mistakes there. And it's exactly what the music industry does. They don't put you in the spots and, you know, out on, out on the road touring and, and they just don't, they protect, um, 
a little different now in this generation, but they protect your, the, the, the act, um, they, they, they don't, you know, they don't let you sing live. They don't do this. They don't do that. So when you're on the national stage, um, in those days, uh, he, he wanted me to come out and be seasoned. So, and we'll get to this from the time I, you know, debuted at the WWF, my in-ring work, I'd been wrestling seven years, um, every night in territories in Memphis, uh, in Japan and Puerto Rico. So I, I had, I don't know, two or 3000 matches under my belt before I ever stepped foot in a WWF refereeing full time. There's a lot of equity in that. So you wind up in a Northeast loop for the WWF in early October, working against iron Mike sharp at the Meadowlands and the Baltimore arena, and also Barry Horowitz at the Springfield civic center and the Boston garden. Uh, how'd you wind up on this loop? What was it like and, and how did it come to be? See, w- kudos to you, Conrad, and your research team, like, cause I, I'm sure people, you know, I'd even forgot some of this. So I really debuted, but not really, but I mean, my pre debut as a baby face, I remember being a baby face in the Northeast going, Oh boy. I've heard some stories about Philly and Boston and New York crowds. And here comes this baby face. And although Iron Mike and Barry Horwitz, you know, great talent they they knew how to have a match with me, uh, as, as a young baby face, but still, it was just a little bit of different, but you know, me getting out of the, the, the routine of doing Memphis, Louisville, Evansville, and Nashville on a weekly basis and getting to go to the garden, uh, in Boston and, all, all these bigger events. Uh, it was very cool to me. Boston garden. I mean, what a historic you grew up watching WWF TV. So many major moments happened both there and the Meadowlands. And now you're in these historic venues. Uh, and again, I know you grew up, you know, going to the, the big matches in Memphis and, and that's uh, obviously a historic building too, but being a wrestling junkie, you had to be pretty excited to be working in the Meadowlands and, uh, in the Boston garden specifically, huh? For sure. I mean, it, it, you know, it's, it's like, wow, this is, uh, I mean, enamored, I'm trying to think of the right descriptive words. I was super hyped up that real that, probably, huh? Maybe surreal. Yes. He, he, you know, um, and, and let alone the, the payoff was going to be better, but I was excited to get the opportunity and to prove my worth. And it goes without saying not work for my father. There, there comes a time in every kid's life that, you know, I, I believe, or I don't know, I don't want to speak for other kids, but you know, when, fly. yeah, exactly. Step out on your own. So tell me about, you know, going into that WWF dressing room, you know, the first day you're, when you sort of work the match with Brett there in Memphis and hop the rail, you're kind of hanging out in the back and that's one thing, but now to be on a tour as they say, making towns and working these big buildings and you're not in your backyard. You're not right up the road from home. You're, you're in the WWF territory. How was it? How were, were you welcome by the other guys? I mean, I know this I, sounds weird. I'm trying to find a way to bring it up without being weird, but a lot of those guys have come through your dad's territory and a lot of them probably looked at you side-eyed like, look at this motherfucker. You know, I wish I had the, uh, the, 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 what the cards were on this loop. I don't remember anything. I always, you know, knew the etiquette, uh, look a guy in the eye and shake his hand, uh, introduce himself, all of that stuff of stuff I think is still valuable today, but it's just such a different environment. Cause you know, it's just so much more many moving parts, you know, at these shows, I'm sure there were two agents, uh, and you know, 20 talents. So it doesn't take you long to, uh, introduce yourself to all of them. But, um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't know if Savage was there. I'm well, sure. Let me, let me run through it. It's Tatanka, the Mountie, Mike Sharp, who's your opponent in the first night. It's October 1st, by the way, in East Rutherford, New Jersey, 6,700 fans. Owen Hart, Coco, uh, Double Trouble, uh, Davy Boy Smith, Shawn Michaels, Sherry, Terry Taylor, Jim Powers, Jim Duggan, Repo Man, The Undertaker, Ultimate Warrior, Big Boss Man, Nails, Kamala, Razor Ramon, and uh, yeah, what a crew there that first night, October 1st. Okay, so, I mean, the Mountie worked for my father, had a good relationship. Uh, you know, the, 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 the givens are Scott Hall, Shawn Michaels, um, 
there wasn't anybody on that card that I didn't have, you know, I, I can't say that I'd ever, ever met repo man. Uh, he didn't come to the territory. I don't think nails had either Kamala, you know, my father, Jerry Lawler gave Kamala the, the, you know, <laughs> so, I mean, there, there was, I don't say connection with everybody on the card, uh, but way more than 50% that I know, uh, and on some type of level. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I can imagine that I was, uh, asking Sean, uh, when you run down that list, I probably knew Sean best. I could pull him aside and say, Hey man, show me the ropes here without saying that, you know, I'm sure he would say dress, whatever. But, um, I, I knew most of those guys. So the first night is probably a night off working iron Mike, Mike sharp, but the second night they're doing basically a stress test against another guy. Who's got a little indie buzz. Maybe see what you can do with a big monster heel, but not necessarily a WWF staple. He would go on to be known as Damian Demento, but here you worked him as Mondo clean. Do you remember that match in Poughkeepsie, mid Hudson? Yeah. And, and uh, j- just trying to lay it out. And I was always, uh, I, I remember knowing that there is a territory style. And again, this goes back from the education of, of working, you know, Puerto Rico is a different style. Japan's a different style. Texas was even a different style than the Tennessee territory. So I certainly knew there was a different style, but I was uh, uh, making sure that, that, that w- working with Damien, um, okay, we got to make sure this is, is, is simple and God, I wish I knew who the, the, the agents were, the producers were, uh, but, uh, I, cause I'm sure I would have run by a couple of different things. We kept it basic. Uh, I had had so many matches as a baby face. So I sort of knew the, 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 the staple moves I was going to do, but I was very careful to make sure everything was solid. Uh, it's a, it's a, the, the work rate in 92, as opposed to, uh, 2000 and, uh, you know, 2021, um, what's important. And I'm not saying there's a big difference, but you know, I wanted to make sure everything that I did was solid and crisp and, and, um, uh, uh, everything looked good. And uh, they're going to let you finish up this tour, by the way, you're not done uh, after Mondo clean the next day you're in Springfield working with Barry Horowitz, uh, and then another match with Barry Horowitz at the Boston garden. But both of those matches also feel like stress tests. It's not your typical, uh, you know, six minute opener. It's the middle of the card and it's a 15 minute match. 15 minutes is uh that's seeing you know hey how can he do in the deep water did you feel like hey this is my test this is to see if i can hang i don't say test because i was young and in shape and and you know long matches you know no knew how to i guess i could say i was uh uh confident in my in-ring ability um and yeah you damn right 15 minutes is a long time but uh you know, Barry, uh, who lived right up the road, uh, Conrad, I don't know if you know this, but, uh, he, he, he made, uh, he lived in Springfield, Tennessee, which is 20 miles from my house. And he'd kept a house here. He came through the territory. So I knew, uh, stretcher Jack Hart or Barry Horowitz, uh, same guy. Uh, but no, I, I, I was, I don't remember this, but I'm sure I was like, Oh, wow. Hell yeah. I'll go 15. You know, uh, I welcomed the, the opportunity. They're not done with you. They bring you back on the 28th, this time for a TV taping. This feels like one of the shows that Vince would have attended because historically he makes TV. Uh, and this is an interesting show here because, um, well, it's just a weird time for the WWF. Bret Hart's now the world champion, having just beaten Ric Flair and the ultimate warrior still hanging around. So it's a company very much in transition where we've got guys like razor Ramon, but we've also got Randy Savage. Uh, it feels like, uh, neither fish nor foul, but they let you get a win over Rick Martell, who I believe was a substitute for the Mountie. You go six minutes and 12 seconds and you win with the DDT. Were you going to try to use the, the DDT as a finish or was that just what it was that night? They just said, let's do a move. Just come up with something. You know, there, it, it wasn't any, uh, master plan or on anybody's part. Just do it. I remember though, you know, Rick was AWA world champion. Yeah. Uh, I was always a fan of his ability. Um, nice guy, great guy. He was so cool to me and good to me, but you know, that opportunity, but to, to, to take a step back and, and look at the transition 
of, and I'll go back to our early conversation, you know, in 1990, I was, uh, three and a half years, uh, 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 you know, into my career, uh, or four years, whatever it was. So, so, but still young 22, whatever it may be 23. Uh, I still maybe had just broken 200 pounds, small guy. I am a small guy in, in, in 1990 standards. Right. That's the other thing that my old man was like, you know, you're going into a land of giants. Well, fast forward up to what you're talking about now is, is that there was that transition of, from the, the cartoon characters, the Hulkamania era, uh, the larger than life, the, you know, all the big jacked up guys. Uh, and now Brett was champion. When you sort of look at that, um, transition, um, that was the, we were right in the middle. I may not be, uh, right exactly on the dates, but we were right. Like you said, that's why I, I'm trying to make the point that the transition of, 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 of talent going from the monsters to the uh, not so much monster gas. Yeah. Not so much. <laughs> so let's uh, let's talk about Jerry Lawler. He does finally show up and start working for the WWF in late 92 as an announcer. Uh, and it's important to add context to what we're talking about here. These days, Jerry Lawler is a staple for every wrestling fan. They all grew up listening to him on commentary, but before that he was not only a territory owner, and not only a top star, but arguably the biggest and the last territory star. I mean, Memphis was his town in a major way, in a way we can't properly convey on this podcast. So for him to show up after he's been the king of Memphis as a baby face, and now he's on national TV as a heel, how was that received locally in Memphis? Jerry, uh, and, and this is for the historians, but I'll try to be succinct here. The, so being a top star on your wrestling show is one thing. And that came on Saturday mornings, um, you know, obviously around the territory, Nashville, Louisville, Evansville, um, some other markets. But Memphis is where we did our live television show for 90 minutes. And so the 30 minutes that didn't go around uh, the loop uh, we would call those uh, Memphis only spots. And so Lawler was always on those spots for years and years and years and talking about what's going to happen this Monday night. We're talking about uh, this sponsor is brought to you by so-and-so Toyota and my softball team is playing out on Mount, Mount Mariah, which is, uh, you know, whatever he was, he was so engaged with the audience and he's standing next to Dave Brown, who's the weatherman. But, but on top of all that, that's on Saturday mornings on Sunday mornings. It was the Jerry Lawler show, literally a talk show with enormous ratings. I mean, we're in the South and on Sunday mornings, there's church programming and Jerry, the King Lawler in wrestling days. I mean, in Saturdays, it was cartoons in wrestling on Sundays. It's Jerry Lawler show. And so as the WrestleMania uh, got bigger and then WCW, like I said, would come through the great American bash. And so Lawler was that baby face who always took shots at WWF or WCW as they're coming into his town. And I mean, so he was, I mean, he was the baby face and now flipped the script and Kingfish <laughs> has, has, uh, has, has gone to the other side. He's, he's gone to work for the big guys. So Lawler, like only law can do walk that fine line. Um, and he would position it and, and different ways, but it was a big deal specifically in Memphis. Uh, but, but he made it work because he sort of knew the direction he was going. And, you know, at that stage, how old would Lawler have been probably mid forties. Uh, yeah. and if he's, uh, uh, you know, so he knew his in-ring days, uh, were, 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 coming to a close <laughs> and here we are in 2021 i just saw a uh, uh, instagram clip of lawler taking a a, a backdrop it, i mean a slam it's it's amazing <laughs> he really is the dick clark but anyhow uh he knew his full-time days uh, of wrestling were coming to an end and so uh it was fascinating to watch really as a fan for me let's uh Let's talk about how you don't go to work for the WWF for a minute, because it feels like after you have these matches in early April or not April, but October, and then you finish up the month at a, at a television taping Lawler's going to be there, but you're not, but the USWA partnership does happen. 
and you start to see a ton of WWF talent on USWA shows. And you're working with a lot of those guys, but you're not doing it under the bright lights of the world wrestling federation. You have the occasional match against guys like doink and things like that. And we've talked a little bit about some of those matches on our remembering Owen episode. You even get to work giant Gonzalez for the USWA. And I want to ask you about that, but I do want to know from your perspective, did you, did you get any feedback from these matches in October? Do you hear from anyone? Or you just, the the fact that I, you know, come through the curtain, talk to the folks. Oh, great job. Hey man, w- really good stuff. And so it was the, okay, uh, get on the plane, come back home. Okay. When's that call coming? When's that call coming? When's it? And, and it never came. Um, and you know, you just mentioned that doink was Matt Bourne who I'd worked with in Texas a lot. Um, when I first went out there, um, uh, I mean, I met a road with Matt every day. So Matt had gone up there as, as doink. Um, uh, he came into Memphis. I think a, uh, the narcissist Lex Luger, uh, came and did a couple of loops. Uh, Randy Macho Man Savage. Um, gosh, I'd have to look, but I think men on a mission, Nelson and, uh, th- those guys had moved up to the big roster. I think well done. Um, I'm not sure. I'm probably going to mess up some dates and times, but there was talent coming from the WWF uh, down to USWA. And there were some, you know, that, that pipeline that started in 88, 89, 90. Well, it was there for a long time, but you know, guys that was at, that hour in the, that I was in the business with, that they would come through in Memphis and some would stay three months. Some would say six months, some day, nine months, but one way or another, they always ended up, I mean, one of my best friends, Scott Steiner, he, he came through and now he was, by 92 making a boatload of money in Japan. So yes, I, I was by this point, um, I'm like, okay, what is going home? Where, where's this call coming? Uh, it's, I don't know if I'm doing a good job of, of, of the, the, the revolving door talent going both ways, but, uh, Jeff was still making the towns in Memphis. And there was a point of frustration for me that, you know, I looked at my bank account <laughs> as a yeah. young man, I, 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 that, that, that was, that was an issue with me. Not only that, but then they say, Hey, uh, no, you're not ready to go to the WWF. Hey, work this seven foot seven guy here. Giant Gonzalez, get a match out of him, Jeffrey. And, uh, even further was, uh, my old buddy that we go so far back downtown Bruno Harvey Whippleman at this time, he was in, I say in charge, uh, you know, you can imagine old Harvey, uh, downtown Bruno, Bruno Lauer is whatever five, 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 six, he'll get mad at me. Uh, I I don't know his exact height, but you know, he was giant Gonzalez's manager handler. And uh, Bruno has never left Memphis since he came, lives down in walls, Mississippi. Uh, But I'll never forget giant Gonzalez. You have to know the, uh, the, the area, but Blyville, Arkansas, um, you know, it's the national guard armory. And, and when you, gosh, I, I won't do it justice, but in Blyville, Arkansas, when Giant Gonzalez rolls up in these big Cadillacs and his knees are coming through the dashboard and he's in the passenger side and Bruno is driving and he's got those little legs and he's got the seat pushed as far up as you can. I mean, you talk about a mutt and Jeff scenario. Um, but to see Giant Gonzalez, he's a just, you know, whatever height. I mean, he's a freak of nature, but him sitting in a dressing room, uh, it was surreal. I, I remember vividly seeing him make the, the towns just like, damn, this dude's huge. Um, and let's just say he wasn't the most athletic cat in the world either. Uh, but that's, that's a part of Memphis. Uh, I was taught and learned, and I'm very grateful that I did. You can have a match with anybody. Well, when the, when the call finally comes, does it come from JJ Dillon? Does it come from Vince? Does it come from your dad? How does it actually come together where you're coming up? that my father uh, gave me the heads up. And then I had a conversation with Vince, not lengthy. Hey, we're going to bring this in. We're, we're, we've got this character in mind. And I don't think it was on the first phone call. Uh, and then, you know, I'd known JJ and I guess you could say the booking contract and, and, and all the administer, you know, administer part of it. I I talked to all of them. Um, and I was damn excited to go. Uh, how was JJ to deal with easy? Uh, again, um, 
you know, James J. Dillon, uh, the, the first images, which are always ingrained in my brain, uh, were James J. Dillon, the manager of the Ugandan giant Kamala. He right. was living in Florida. He would send up the promos. This is the mid eighties, uh, or early eighties. Yeah. That, free horseman. Oh yeah. Th th that was my, uh, and God, he was such a great talker and you just, th just the effects of He's sing, sending in this guy to de decapitate Lawler. But anyway, so fast forward 10 years and uh, I'm talking to JJ and, you know, we didn't have talent relations in, in, in USWA, but um, so JJ represented, okay, here's the business of the business. So it's easy though. So help me understand. Um, is this a situation where you're discussing, I mean, it's not guaranteed contracts. So there's no sort of <laughs> promise of, of a big payday. We've heard a lot of, of contracts in the era were like, Hey, we're going to give you $50 per TV show. And we're going to book you on 13 TVs or some such nonsense. Did you have a contract like that? I was in that. I just remember, Oh, I got this contract. I'm going to read it. And I read it. And, um, my grandfather, Eddie Marlin. Oh, so what's it all about? And you know, my father, but multiple conversations I had, they would ask me about it. And I said, the only thing I really get around it is I put Jeff Jarrett on there and I own that. And they've guaranteed me $150, but that's only if I'm booked. Conrad, do you know what uh, my father paid me? Um, now the territory that I'm working at the time, at the exact same time. Right. You know what my guarantee was from my old man? No idea. In Memphis, now this is on Mondays, he guaranteed me. Now, I was doing, you know, I don't say there's a lot, but I was doing office work. I was doing whatever he needed. I was an assistant to him. So on Mondays in Memphis, I got a big whopping $150 guarantee. There you go. And, and Louisville and Evansville um, were, were $40 payoffs. But I would always either get 75 or sometimes a hundred and there's a stone cold, uh, pod, uh, podcast that we'll, we'll do down the road, but, um, our paychecks when we were, were exactly the same. Uh, so, so 40 or 75 or a hundred, they were terrible. I mean, literally terrible. I will say this, the bonus I had was, is I got to sell pictures and I always did really well on, uh, selling three by fives and four by sixes and eight by tens. I cannot wait to talk about that Austin story one day, but for now, let's talk about October 16th, 1993, uh, superstars, which is the, the prime time show, if you will. Uh, of course, this is the very early days of Monday night raw, but, uh, superstars is what we all sort of grew up on the big syndicated show over the weekends, your first vignette airs, and it's promoting the debut of Jeff Jarrett. So lot to unpack here. We've heard a lot from Bruce over the years about creative services. Did they send you some sort of sketches or drawings? Do you fly to Stanford and meet with Vince and he lays out a uh, picture it, Jeff? I mean, what, what does that look like from your, no, I mean, there was no, um, not, none of, you know, creative service and Bonanzio, Debbie Bonanzio, but, but as far as the double J character there, there was no uh, images, uh, that I recall, I, I just knew it was a country music star. Uh, and, and I ha had the basic premise of what it was, um, and that we were going to shoot vignettes and, um, I don't want to get too far ahead of us. I'll follow your lead. Uh, but, but, um, when you just said the word superstars in 1993, yep. it's hard because it, you know, we live in streaming service now and, and YouTube and all the socials and all that. But in those days, um, yes, there was cable television, but 93, what were there? 20, 30, maybe cable channels. I may be off, but, but there was, you only watched four or five, yeah. but superstars was everywhere. It was on in every market in yep. prime time. And as a wrestling fan, we all, for me, I'll speak from us. I never missed it ever. Um, and so it was a huge deal that, that, okay, we're going to do these vignettes and they're going to air on superstars every week. I was so fired up for that. So do they say, you know, make a jacket like this, make a hat like that. I mean, what do they lay out to you specifically? Sometimes for a guy like the undertaker, they don't say, uh, you know, dress like an old Western undertaker. They, they create his gear. They create his outfit and you've got these vignettes coming up. Do they tell you, 
you know, run down to the swap meet and get, I mean, what's that look like? So I was working still every night, you know, Memphis, Louisville, Evans, I still, but, but Bruce and, and this is, I guess it's, you know, we'll, we'll get into the setup of it, but I, I found out Bruce, um, which me and Tom, his brother, um, uh, Tom Pritchett, part of ad free family, we were really close, like big buddies. And so now he has brothers come into town to produce these vignettes and they're sending Kerwin, um, and you know, the WWE and we, we've, we've talked off air, uh, uh just recently, Conrad, uh, we both, you know, we're talking about the WWE production now, but back in those days, you know, WWF production was just, and it's still head and shoulders, in my opinion, above sports and just so many different ways, but it was a really big deal. And they're going to send their director <laughs> to Nashville to shoot vignettes for this brand new character. I, I remember trying to digest that. I thought that was huge. Like, okay. Uh, so this is a lot bigger than a Memphis promo, but Bruce coming and okay. What are you wearing? And, you know, in me and Vince's conversation, and I don't know if me and Bruce had any in-depth conversations, but it is a, um, flamboyant, uh, and I know McMahon used Porter Wagner and that's an old country, mm -hmm. but, but basically a very fam a flamboyant country music singer, uh, a professional wrestler that looks like, I mean, a country music, uh, a singer, uh, that's going to look like a, that's going to be a professional wrestler, everything that went with that. So I knew I needed to get a hat, but just not a regular hat. I knew I needed to get blazers and, and, and dress it all up. And so, uh, you know, uh, Time out for a minute. If you're not familiar with the name Porter Wagner, you're not alone. I know who that is, but I'm just saying, throw it in your Google machine and click Google image. And when Vince lays out Porter Wagner esque, that'll tell you the tale of how Jeff knew what to dress like. In a lot of ways. Yes. Um, but a flamboyant and at, at, at the time, uh, I can remember telling my wife, Jill, uh, you know, like, so we've got to put this together. You can't go buy this off the rack. Uh, right. You know, so, you know, going to the fabric store and creating all kind of outfits. Um, that's, that's what we did. I mean, like who was we, you and Jill? Yes. Yes. Like we got to go create and we had to do it so quick. Like, so, so you didn't, you didn't go to a seamstress. You and Jill made this shit. Oh yeah. Because it was like, you, you're, I mean, yes. <laughs> so a lot of people, <laughs> I guess we'll get to it. It's like, who came up with that? Uh, I'm raising my hand here. I did. My wife did uh, at the time, you know, it, it just, that's what we, we had to, uh, and we wanted to, um, but also we were under a time crunch cause it went down quick. Like, um, my notification of me working and okay, we got to have these outfits. Um, I, I remember going to the hat store, uh, and trying on four or five, cause I'd never worn cowboy hats in my life. I don't wear bell caps. I, I've just, I've never been a hat guy, but Okay, I've got a shades, uh, you know, and you just look at and look at the time in Nashville, uh, there was a generation of stars. You might have heard of Garth Brooks and Clint Black and rings a bell, a few of them. But anyway, they were called the hat acts uh, because all the stars of the early 90s in country music wore hats. Uh, ha wore hats. And so cowboy hats in Nashville were very accessible. There's and then cowboy boots and all that. I, I, I wore boots around the farm. I, I, but by this stage of my career, um, I, I wasn't a cowboy boot guy, uh, uh, you know, day in, day out. Anyway. So I had to put the wardrobe together in, in, in less than a week. So the, do they lay out, Hey, we want you to do six weeks of vignettes or eight weeks or whatever it is. And we're going to send Bruce down to Charlotte or, I mean, not Charlotte, but Nashville, or how does that yeah. work? And, and, and I want to, you know, Bruce may have better recall on this than me, but I'm pretty sure Bruce was like, now, how many outfits do you got? Cause we're going to do a lot, like a whole lot. And I'm like, Whoa, <laughs> okay. Like how many? And then we went into the props. Um, but anyway, so I knew that I had my work cut out and I had to have six or eight outfits. And then, um, you know, I, I you know, I know, and I, gosh, I wish I, I could remember the, the, the dates and times, but look, you know, Bruce on the fly, you know, Tootsie's, there's a real cool vignette there. And then, um, well, let me tell you, we're going to play some of those, but I'll just want to add the context of this. Uh, the superstars where this airs, the matches were recording 
uh, were recorded at uh, Worcester Mass at the Memorial Auditorium, September 28th, 1993. There's 2,000 fans on hand. So about two weeks and change later is when they start airing on Superstars. Now, I'm not saying that you filmed this in Worcester on September 28th. I'm just giving the context that the matches that would appear around your vignette were about two and a half weeks old. It was in September because it was roasting hot. And when we get into the one with the, because a family member of mine owned a big antique blue Cadillac that we used. Um, we were, you know, we were running and gunning and, and, and Bruce, I think tells the story that he was under the assumption that my old man was going to scout some locations. Um, and that quite wasn't the, the, the fact, uh, or how it transpired out, but there was a lot of run and gun and it was so fun. But the thing for me as a talent, Conrad, I had never been a heel ever, like ever done a heel promo. Um, this was all going to be new. Obviously, I'd never played a country music star or, uh, you know, the Double J character. So all of that was going to be new. Um, but the outfits, the locations, Kerwin, Bruce. Um, and, you know, as far as being produced, and I know I feel like I'm jumping around here, but, you know, my father had produced me when he was at Memphis TV. And then uh, Lawler would produce me if he was booking the TV. And outside of Robert Fuller, because Robert would really give me feedback and he was such a great talker. I'd really never been produced, so to speak. I'd been told, go say, hit these bullet points. When I'd come through the curtain, it would be, that's terrible. You lost your train of thought, or that was really good, or this could have done better. But that was about the extent of being produced and feedback. Now, all of a sudden, the big time hit in my brain. Uh, Because Bruce... uh, I'll just say this as we get into this. I think Bruce has many, many skill sets, like a lot. And in 2017, when he came and worked for me at, 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 you know, for that time, um, he has an unusual ability and he's right up there with the very best of producing talent in a way that um, very few producers can do. I'll just say that. And I found that out real quick. The reason I say that is when he started laying out literally vignette one, I was just like, wow, here we go. This is good. Bruce has told us before when he was doing stuff in the eighties, you know, Mr. Perfect vignettes and million dollar man vignettes and things like that. He's, uh, he's not exactly going downtown and getting permits and blocking off roads. It's very, it's shot very much guerrilla style. Same yeah. experience for you. It's unbelievable. When I look back now, I'm standing outside of Tootsie's world famous Willie Nelson. I mean, you name it. If you're a country music fan, but you I know, mean, it. It, yes, you, you know it, but, and look, Nashville in 93, isn't anything like it is now, but Tootsie's ha- has been the one honky tonk that has not only lasted, it's a landmark, but it was a landmark in the early nineties and, and Bruce is producing me and I'm knocking like, here's this character. I'm going to talk crap about country music. And, and Bruce is like, Hey, uh, we're going to be right outside Tootsie's. We're going to be saying a few things, but hey, he's just kidding. Just, he has a way of getting things done, but you know, the Ryman auditorium, the mother church of country music. And at that time it was closed for the remodel. And we're out there making, you talk about run and gun. You watch that vignette back, uh, vignette back. I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's run and gun, no permits, uh, really cool stuff. Um, but it was the foundation of the double J character. And obviously I'm viewing it different today, but my God, how lucky, how blessed, how grateful you talk about really defining character development before I ever step foot in the ring. I believe this is a blueprint. I carried it on in my TNA days. It's a real blueprint on character development. Well, let's, uh, let's take a listen to the very first one. It starts with that familiar guitar. That would be your WWF theme for many years. You're at the country music hall of fame. You talk about how you were born into a wrestling family. Well, let's just play it. Here we go. Hello folks. Jeff Jarrett here. That's double J. J E double F J A double R E double T. That's double J. You're going to hear a lot of that name coming up. We're at the country music hall of fame. I'm going to tell you folks just in a second, exactly why we're here. 
You see, I was born into a wrestling family. It was predetermined I was destined to become the greatest wrestler of all time. And quite frankly, I've become that. Everybody here in the South knows that. And shortly, everybody in the WWF will. But I'm coming to the WWF for a couple of reasons. You know, my true love, it's not what comes second nature to me. It's not, it's not what I'm the greatest at. It's not wrestling. It's what's in my heart. <laughs> and that's country music, the country music business. You know, I've got more singing talent, more dancing talent, more stage presence, more charisma than any of all the other country music stars put together. But I can't get my break. Maybe it's because uh, I'm a local boy, a Music City native, or maybe it's because the corrupt politics in the business, in the country music industry. Well, take, for example, that fat boy Garth Brooks. He's a transplanted Oklahoman. He comes in here to Music City, and they try to make him the greatest thing since sliced, br sliced bread. It just makes me sick to my stomach. He ought to be the Pillsbury Doughboy instead of a country music star. <sighs> He's making more babies than he is hits. Oh, it makes me sick to my stomach. Yep, but what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna use the WWF. I'm gonna use you, Randy Savage, and I'm gonna use you, Lex Luger, and you, Bret Hart, and the list goes on and on. But those old Double J, when he gets done proving he's the greatest wrestler of all time, <laughs> the country music business is gonna come begging, gonna come on their hands and knees, crawling, kissing my feet, begging me to sign a contract. And then when after that's all over, I'm gonna come back here to the Hall of Fame. This old sign here, <laughs> they're gonna tear it down. They're gonna build a life-size statue and they're gonna make it double J, gold-plated, life-size. And then old Country Music Hall of Fame, they're gonna rename that. It's gonna be the Double J Hall of Fame. And I'm gonna have gold records and I'm gonna have life-size portraits in there. <laughs> Don't you forget that. Double J, it's J-E, Double F, J A, double R E, double T. That's double J, Jeff Garrett. All right, old double J. So there you go, your very first vignette. Uh, <laughs> what'd you think listening to that one back? Yeah, uh, it's it brought back a lot of memories, but I was sitting there thinking, uh as since we've launched my world, people are like, I hated Jeff. That vignette sort of sums it up. Uh there was nothing to like about that character. Nope. That accent, uh, which I still have, obviously, but Really? Uh -oh. <laughs> what, what are you giggling at? <laughs> well, the, oh, oh, that thing. <laughs> and then I don't even know why, but I don't like that. You did the two finger thing. Yeah. The two fingers, the, the twangy accent, um, just the casualness that I, uh, am the greatest wrestler that ever lived. You're a wrestling fan. Like who is this guy? I've never even seen him wrestle. And I know it's a different era, but it, it, and, and that goes without saying, but 1993 and the cockiness and running down. And then I, I mean, who is this guy? And I'm taking shots at Savage and Brett and, and, and razor just right off the bat. And, and Garth Brooks. Huh? And Garth Brooks. And yeah. Oh yeah. He's making more babies than he, uh, making more babies than he has hits Br Bruce. I mean, Bruce, that uh, Bruce, you just got to give him so much credit because, and Kerwin, it would just, it set the stage of who the double J character was. And there was nothing to like about the guy. None. At that point, when you saw, first of all, by the way, one of my favorite things in there, cause I just know how, I don't know, but I think I know how Vince thinks that vignette would have never aired where you hear that airplane fly over the top where it was coming through that audio. He would have been like, do it again. Right. So Bruce, uh, and Bruce, I, I think I've heard, uh, or I recall part, I listened to the whole episode of something Russ with uh, on this, but, um, v Vince was in Stanford. He wasn't on, on site. And so my gut tells me that Bruce would have said, Hey Vince, uh, this was the second or third take and airplanes were flying over us all day. Uh, so we decided to keep that as, as a keeper. And at that point it had already moved on. So I don't know why Bruce kept it but it might've been one of those things that we've just alluded to when you're guerrilla style running and gunning, we might've gotten run off of the country. Cause we're yeah. there. We are, we're at the country music hall of fame <laughs> with a film crew. Yes. And not talking very kindly about the country music industry and the corrupt politics. 
And, uh, I saw your gear there. You just laid out that you and Jill made it. Did, were you already doing the two finger point? Is that a Vinceism? That's a Bruce's. I mean, I think I was might've, as we're going back and forth, um, Bruce is like, yeah, do two fingers or you got two fingers really define that. And it's double J and I'm spelling the name because the spelling of the name, you know, Vince and Bruce had the conversation and Vince latched on to it. Bruce, look at his name, two J's, two, you know, two F's, two R's, two T's. Uh, that, that's like Vince's wet dream, right? He loves the alliteration. He likes yeah. like Hulk Hogan, Hunter Hearst Helmsley. He likes when it's the same thing twice. So you already have that with Jeff Jarrett, but you also have double R's, double T's, the whole deal. Yeah. The branding of it. That's Vince's brain. Um, it's just dialed into that. And so the two fingers uh, are better than one. Um, it just worked. God, it used to get heat with folks. What about the, uh, the, the iconic theme song that, that little guitar riff, you know, when we're first starting and all that, can you tell us about, well, it's not even a guitar riff. Just tell us about the, the iconic sound that we hear there. Had you already heard that? That feels like a Jim Johnston thing. Had you already heard that before you recorded it? Or do you hear no. it? Well, we do. No. And I, the first time I heard that was when I recorded uh, Superstars on a VHS recorder uh, and heard the music put to it. And I'm like, that is the, that is the corniest music I've ever heard. And I can tell you that I was like, hmm, I understand I'm a heel and there's not supposed to be anything they like. Dang, gum, that's corny. I just remember it just sort of went all over me. And I'm like, okay, I'll go with it. But man, it was, uh, <laughs> and you called it an iconic riff. That's uh, chuckle worthy for me, but it evolved into that. But uh, yeah. Well, it's cool. It was at home. It was a notice for me to change the damn channel. You know, yeah. it was like Pavlovian. Oh, not this guy. Bloop. <laughs> See what Silk Stockings is doing right now. <laughs> um, so your, uh, your, your silly smile and little sparkle noise at the end. That's all Bruce Pritchard shit, is it not? The grin or the gold tooth? Both. The gold tooth was in uh, Titan TV or WWF TV. Um, the grin, Bruce could get into it and he would, like, that's what I'm saying as far as producing. I might have been trying to smirk, but but Bruce could do it over the top at the drop of a hat. And I'd go, oh, okay. okay, I'm doing it about a three and Bruce wants me to do it about a 10. So there's the difference in being coachable and producible, but you got to have the guy pushing you. And so I'm like, wow. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do that. Do that. Anyway. Um, the, the big smirk, uh, was definitely heavily influenced by Bruce. Uh, you're 26 years old here in hindsight. Was it a lot to take in? Oh, for sure. I mean, the vignettes and after we got, you know, we, all the vignettes we produced, I can remember just going, wow, this is, uh, it was a big deal. I mean, I, I knew like, okay, we're going to run vignettes and we're building. And when you hear Vince McMahon, who was the play by play guy, uh, you know, he walked out the other night, uh, <laughs> at the beginning of SmackDown, uh, you know, J just, but, but, it, you know, so you, you, you don't see Vince but nowadays back then he was standing in the ring at WrestleManias and he was the lead play-by-play -play guy on Monday night raw and superstars with gorilla, you know, not gorilla with, with Bobby Heenan or Jesse, the body. But when you would hear Vince refer to double J, it was like, okay, uh, old kid from Hendersonville, Tennessee has hit the big time because, I'm talking about his promotion. Again, he's the owner of the promotion. You know, my father was the owner of promotion around here. Now the, the owner of the WWF is talking about this character. It was the big time for me. Oh my goodness. Let's, uh, let's take a listen to another one. Uh, this is a promo number two and, uh, here we go. Oh, double J here again. That's J E double F J A double R E. Double T. Told you folks you're going to be hearing a lot from me next couple of weeks. You know, I was telling you about the corrupt politics in the country music business, about the wrongdoings in the country music industry. Well, I'm here today at the King Daddy, the Emperor, the Godfather of them all, 
Buddy Lee Attractions. That's right. Buddy Lee is the premier, the number one talent agency in the world today. But it looks like old Buddy won't give Double J a break, won't give a local boy, a, a Music City native, a break. I guess you gotta be from California or New York City or Oklahoma or, or Texas, Austin, Texas, Willie Nelson. You know him. What is he, about 95 years old? Oh my lord, the greasiest hair you ever seen, decrepit. You know old Buddy Lee? He made old Willie a lot of money. Oh, it makes me sick to my stomach. He's a redheaded stranger. He's a stranger, all right. A stranger to music. Can't carry a tune in a bucket. Can't sing a lick, unlike myself. The greatest voice in this town today. The greatest singer in the world today. Not only the greatest singer, but the greatest wrestler. And I'm gonna prove it to you, Undertaker. Oh, <laughs> I'm gonna prove it to you, Mr. Perfect. And you Steiner boys, yeah, I like things in double. I'm gonna prove it to you at the same time that I am the greatest wrestler in the world today. And when I'm done, and when I'm finished using the WWF, I'm gonna come back here to Music Row. I'm gonna come back here to Buddy Lee Attractions. And Buddy Lee himself's gonna walk out that door, this door right here. No, he's not gonna walk. He's gonna crawl on his hands and knees. And he's gonna beg, and he's gonna plead. And he's gonna say, please, Double J, please sign the dotted line because he wants to tell the world, he wants to tell Nashville, he wants to tell all the country music business that he signed. <laughs> double J, that's J-E-double-F, J-A-double-R-E-double-T, double J, Jeff Jarrett. <laughs> Conrad, that Buddy Lee Attractions is about two blocks from the Country Music Hall of Fame. And as that was playing, I remember walking down. Um, can you, let me ask you, can you hear in your mind, if you closed your eyes and just put the Bruce voice, can you hear Bruce telling me that promo? Yes, uh, of course. Absolutely. I mean, can't you? I, yeah. I literally had a flashback of, of, <laughs> of Bruce doing it. I really did. Oh, the... Willie Nelson comments and uh, Cali. Did you hear? How did I say California? That 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 was a Bruceism. Like like, don't just say California. Just California or whatever I just said. Yeah. I don't. It was all. There's a lot of Bruce in that. Um, I just got a big grin on my face just hearing it back. <laughs> so these are airing week after week, and and you've got your silly get ups here. And I think the jacket we just saw in promo number two. Actually, I know you still have that one, which is pretty remarkable. Um but there's a lot of context I want to add here in October, Hulk Hogan's movie, Mr. Nanny is going to come out, but that's around the same time that Vince McMahon is indicted for distribution of steroids. And you're making your debut around the same time when these vignettes start airing, I'm sure you're excited. Hey, this is my, my shot at the big time, but is it in the back of your mind that damn, I might be too late. This thing's coming to an end. Um, I, re well, I don't say that. No, not coming to an end that uh, there was definitely change was in the air and look, I had been going to work for seven years, every Monday to Memphis, every Tuesday to Louisville, every, in you know, I, I knew those days were coming to an end. And of course I was ready to move on to make money, but I'm still a baby face in the territory, but now I'm a heel on WWF TV. And there's some chatter, uh, of in the dressing room and with the fans, the, you know, the, the, like the regular, regular, regular fans who never missed. It was such a unique time in my career because there's a transition. I can't say that I had any context to the Mr. Nanny coming out. Obviously the, the indictment was huge news, but, um, you know, I, I didn't think the company was going anywhere. Let's, uh, Let's talk about something that's changing in the middle of these vignettes airing or so it feels, it feels as if you're getting your big break here, your vignettes are airing. You're finally out from under your dad's thumb. And well, apparently JJ Dillon recommended that Vince McMahon call your dad and suggest he come and be a bigger part of the world wrestling federation. Is that bittersweet for you where I know you love your dad, obviously, but it felt like, Hey, I'm finally out of my own, get to do my own thing. But. Damn, dad's coming here too now. I don't remember anything specifically of 
I'll say good or bad other than it's just business. I, I, you know, it went without saying that the territory we weren't drawing and, and, and the business model, I don't think I called it the business model, but I knew, um, it, it wasn't a rocket science just to look that, you know, I was buddies. I remember getting a, uh, not, I remember seeing one of Mr. Perfect's booking sheets, um, at one time and maybe Sean, you know, they're, they're literally all over the world and we're uh, a, a one pager of the same town week after week. It's like, I knew the business model of the industry was just changing. Uh, lot, lots more TV, uh, lots more product on TV with raw, um, you know, just, there, there was a, there was definitely change in the air. And so him going and working for Vince, uh, obviously the, the indictment and, um, you know, I, I didn't really look at him going up being a part of creative. I, I guess that, that wasn't in the, in my mind. Uh, and again, I'd worked under him for all those years. So it wasn't a big deal to me, I guess the easiest thing to say. So talk to me a little bit about that vignette we just saw or listened to before we clicked record, you said, Hey, on that second one, remind me to tell you about Ronnie P Gossett. Now. So Ronnie is, um, so this first round of vignettes, it was just me. And then oh, okay. there's a later vignette that comes up, uh, where I'm actually in, uh, buddy Lee's offices. And, um, Tony Conway and his son, Matt Conway worked for me at TNA for a lot of years. Well, I may, I may have that. Hang on one second. Right. We we've got that. Let's, uh, let's listen to the third one here. This is grand old Opry. And this one's a lot shorter than the other two. Here we go. Double J here again. J E double F J A double R E double T. We're here at Tootsie's world famous orchid lounge. You know, we got the pictures up here of Hank Sr. and Pat Decline and Boxcar Willie. I've been telling you about the corrupt politics in country music, hadn't I? And Boxcar Willie's a fine example. What is he, a bum, a wino, a, a never was? Huh. Like another guy they're trying to bring along. He ain't nothing. It's some Italian boy. Billy Ray Cyrus, got them buggy whip arms, jumping around like he's sweating to the oldies with Richard Simmons. Makes me sick to my stomach. He can't sing. He can't dance. Double J can here. Got the best voice in Music City today. Can dance better than anybody in Music City today. Oh, that Billy Ray, I'd like to slap the taste right out of his mouth. Some some other Italian guy I'd like to smack, that's that Razor Ramon. And I'm gonna do it when I get face to face with him. Italian. And that men on a mission. Yeah, I'm gonna put them on a mission. Back to the homeless joint where they belong. Oh. And one, two, three, kid, all you're gonna be hearing is one, two, three, when I pin your shoulders to the mat. And then when it's all said and done, and I've proven my point that I am the world's greatest wrestler. No, I'm not going to come to Tootsie's. No, from coast to coast, you know what they're going to be wanting? Every record store, they're going to be wanting the album, the debut album. Oh, of Double J. That's J E double F, J A double R, E double T, double J. Jeff Cheer. So that's the one you were talking about earlier outside of Tootsie's. I love that you said the, uh, I mean, to me, Razor Ramon is based on Tony Montana. Who's from Cuba. He's not Italian, but that makes it even better somehow. Of course. And Billy Ray Cyrus is not Italian either. No, of course not. <laughs> it's tremendous. Uh, uh, this is one from, uh, November 15th. This is you in a recording studio. <laughs> Howdy folks. Double J here again. That's J E double F. J A double R E double T. That's double J Jeff Jerry. Got my driver here, Billy Ray Brooks. Brought me down here today in my vintage 68 Cadillac. You know, fine cars are like fine wine. They just seem to get better with age. Isn't that right, Billy Ray? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. You know, old double J here, he takes care of his property. Unlike the corrupt country music business. You know, they say proof's in the pudding. Well, I got the pudding right here. Take a look. Uh -huh. Here it is, the finest example of the corrupt country music business. The Ryman Auditorium, home of the Grand Ole Opry. Well, look at this place, graffiti on the walls. This place is run down, it's in shambles, it's condemned. Well, this place is dead. 
just like two of the greatest country music stars ever to play on that stage in there, right here on this stage, Conway Twitty. Why, he's dead and buried. Oh, Lord. And another guy, George Jones. He's still breathing all right, but his career's been dead for years. Oh, neither one of them guys could sing. Oh, unlike Double J here. Speaking of death, hey, Billy Ray, what's that dead boy's name in the WWF? Undertaker. Yeah, The Undertaker. This place reminds me of The Undertaker. Dead, decrepit, run down, in shambles. Undertaker boy, I'm going to use you. And I'm going to use the WWF. And when I get done, oh, after it's all said and done, they're going to rename the WWF. That's right, they're going to rename it the Double JF. Oh, that's right. And then they're gonna come back here. That's right, look at this sign. It's not gonna say Ryman Auditorium. It's not gonna say home of the Grand Ole Opry. It's gonna say the Double J Auditorium. That's right, the home of the greatest country music singer that ever lived. That's right, Jeff Jarrett. Oh, oh Double J. That's Double J, J-E, Double F, J-A, Double R, E, Double T. That's Double J. Jeff Jarrett. <laughs> All right. I love that on the second vignette forward, they started actually typing your name on the screen as you said it. So when you're hitting the double F, both F's appear. And I love this one with this giant old car. Who's who had that car? So that's a, that, I was going to say is it's one thing, man, there is a, for, I'll use your turn. A lot to unpack here. You could hear, hear the energy and the inflection in my voice and you just referenced that tv started spelling out my name uh, we're adding a character there and for those that don't know that's tony falk the guy that i had my very first match with uh he's the driver uh, again uh, you know worked in the territory worked for my family for years and years and years there's a whole funny story on that that he literally sat at attention for an hour with the car running he, he could have put it in park but he had his foot on the brake i mean there's some Really funny. I wish there probably weren't too many outtakes because we were blowing and going. I mean, this is right in front of the auditor uh, uh, Ryman Auditorium. At the time, it was doing a remodel. It was run down. Uh, and Bruce, uh, again, took advantage of that. Um, but j just the whole energy of it. Uh, bringing back, I've got a, got a lot of smiles on my face today because I can just remember Bruce being off camera and us doing a, a, a take and him going, Oh man, that's good, but we can get better and him pulling it out of it. And just the whole vibe of it. Uh, because now as the vignettes progressed, um, we're starting to add, you know, the, the, the one at Tootsie's and the country music hall of fame and outside of Buddy Lee attractions as by myself, but now I've got somebody to play off of. And here's a driver in a 69 Cadillac and it was beautiful. Uh, so again, you can just hear through this whole progression of the character development. I guess that's one of the things, uh, yes, it's, I'm biased. It's my character, but a as a talent and as a promoter to hear the character progress in an amount of weeks and the platform that Vince gave me, it was really cool times. I love that you called him undertaker boy. <laughs> That was good stuff, man. Oh, that's eat. <laughs> Did Bruce name, uh, Tony Falk, Billy Ray Brooks, obviously Billy Ray Cyrus had one of the biggest hits in the world. Of and, course. uh, yeah. yeah, of course, Ray Brooks hilarious. Well, uh, he driver cap on and him sitting at attention and he had a couple of lines in there. That's under, I mean, oh, Tony's great. Tony's absolutely great. This is November 22nd. So this is going to be a week before. Uh, you guys go to uh, a TV taping where I believe you're going to have your very first match. Uh, so this is a week before uh, you ha you tape your very first match. Stop it down. Stop it down. Stop it down. <laughs> My gosh, that's awful. Cut, cut, cut. Stop it down. Where do you Good find point. these pickers at? But Double J, this is the 25th audition today. And they're all horrible. I'm, oh. But none of them as good as you, Double Well, certainly the they're not. Yeah, exactly, the certainly not. I guess I got to play the piano. And I guess I got to play the drums. And I guess I'm the greatest singer in this town. Now it looks like I got to play the guitar. Oh, my You're gosh. You're the best, Double J. Guitar. It's a verse. Oh, and it's Jackie. Gosh, that was awful. Hey, boy, where'd you get that guitar at? Where'd you learn how to play? That was that was terrible. Vince Gill, old Sweet Pea, was in here a little while ago, and he couldn't make the Double J band, and I threw him out. Now, why don't you get out of here? I guess I'm going to have to do it myself. Yeah, 
I'm gonna have to do it myself to get to the top in the country music business. But I'm gonna do that. Don't you worry about that. And I'm gonna get to the top in the WWF. Yeah, they may call it the WWF right now, but when I'm done with them, they're gonna call it the Double J F. Ha! Don't you forget that name. That's Double J, J E Double F, J A Double R E Double T. That's Double J now, Jeff Jarrett. <laughs> I got to tell you, I like when they're a little faster. Uh, I think that helps sure. more. Yeah. That's me and Bruce getting our, getting our groove and quick interaction and, and progressing through it and, and getting to the point uh, off the top. I'll shut up Conrad, but he, when Bruce remember says, stop it down. I'm like, stop it down. That's heat. It, it, it's so irritating. Stop it down. Stop it down. Anyway. Who was the, uh, who was the guy auditioning? Do you recall? Good buddy of mine. Benny Boland, uh, we still, I still see him on social media. He lives here. Uh, he ran a gym, uh, but, but, uh, but his, he's a, he's an incredible bluegrass artist is, is, uh, is, is a professional, uh, but he's, he can really pick and sweet P for those country music fans that might've caught that. That's a nickname given to Vince Gill. Uh, cause he's a really, really good picker. And, uh, how did miss Jackie, miss Texas get involved? And that's going to say hearing Jackie's voice, you know, Miss Texas, uh, who came up from literally, uh, our, uh, you know, the, te the Texas, uh, Tennessee relationship, she came to Tennessee and she, you know, in those days, we didn't have a lot of, um, female rest, uh, wrestlers. So Jackie, I mean, she had transgender matches in the early nineties and I can remember, uh, her beating the hell out of Brian Lawler and Brian Lawler beating the hell out of her in some matches. Uh, Jackie, one tough son of a gun. Um, but, um, she was, again, we were looking for a female for the vignettes. Um, and, uh, she fit the bill. I mean, the four people that we used were Jackie, who was in the Tennessee territory. We just talked about Tony Falk. Um, and, and another one, we had a guy that we referred to him like a step and fetch it. Frank Morrell, who was one of my mentors. I rode with him every day for six or seven years. He was a wrestler, uh, but he had, uh, took the role of being a referee in the territory. And then Ronnie P Gossett, uh, was the manager that when we busted back in on buddy Lee attractions and they threw me out. So it oh, was here a, you go. Uh, this may be it right here. This is November 29th, 1993. Howdy right folks, old Double J here again. I told you a couple of weeks ago that I was coming back here to Buddy Lee Attractions. And here's Buddy Lee's cousin himself, R.P. Lee. He set up the meeting. Oh, I can't wait to talk to Buddy. Here we go. Howdy, ma'am. Where's Buddy at? He's expecting us. Old R.P. Lee himself. He set up the meeting. Where's Buddy at? Who are you? <laughs> Who am I? I'm Double J. That's J-E-double-L. J-A-double-R-E-double-T. That's Double J. Buddy must be in the back. Oh, he's he's back, back here. Howdy, man. You look nice today. Where's Buddy at? Oh, he's, he's got to be in the back. Honey, you sure do look pretty. Here we go. Buddy back here? Where's Buddy at? Where, where's Buddy Lee? How you doing? Double J, how you doing today? It's Good. RP. This is Buddy's Good cousin. Good to see you. How you doing? You guys not supposed to be here today. Oh, no. Buddy's expecting to see you in the back. No, Buddy's not here. I'm Don't you know who he is? Don't you know who I am? I'm Double J. Yeah, you're, you're the wrestler that was here last week putting our axe down. Oh, no, no, no. Hey, hey, you, hey, hey. Our buddy's here. I want to see him. He must be yeah, in the back. You, you ought to stick to wrestling. Get your stinking hands off of me. Hey, I'm the best singer this town's ever had. You just give me a shot. Hey, I got more charisma than any of your acts. Get him out. Hey, get your stinking hands off of me. And you can hands off him. Hey, where's Buddy at? I need to Hey, I'm telling you, you're going to regret this. You're going to regret this, boy. Hey, what a little test that you passed to get this guy. Hey, I got more charisma. I can sing better. I, hey, I, I, I can dance better than all I've put together. You're going to regret this. Hey, that's J-E, double F, and don't forget it. J-A, double R, E, double T, that's double J now. <laughs> Jeff Jarrett. I got to tell you, my favorite part of the whole thing is when they zoom in on the security footage, the little camera on her desk at the end, and we see you in, uh, RP in the elevator, classic stuff. <laughs> so well done from a production point of view and, and the, the interaction and, you know, buddy Lee for though he has, he, he owned a, and his kids run it now, uh, a booking agent, but buddy had ties to the wrestling business back in the sixties and seventies. So, and they also promoted the WWF during the eighties. So there was a connection there, but, but so, uh, doing that and, and Tony Conway, throwing me out of the office. But again, going back to the very core of this, looking at through the eyes of Vince McMahon and Bruce Pritchard uh, and Kerwin, 
the character development. I just go back to it's a, a my world podcast, but the character development and how things there, I was detestable, but it was defining what I was going to do when I arrived uh, in the wrestling ring. And so telling all this backstory, man, I got so lucky. What a foundation it built. And let's appreciate how slow the build was. I mean, we didn't play them all. I know some of our listeners are probably thinking, God, how many are they going to play? We played half. There's a total of 12 vignettes. We played six for you here today. I hate we missed the one with Frank Morrell because Frank had a nickname in the territories that I think would get over with our podcast crowd. Should we share that or not so much? Oh, when we got the the live shows coming up and man, the offers coming in Conrad, but, uh, we, we'll share that on a live show. I think it's much more in tune for our, you know, uh, a, a live audience. I'll be able to describe it better. 12 vignettes though, uh, before you ever have a match on TV, uh, as far as I know. Uh, I think the, uh, the first time you actually work a match that winds up airing on TV, it's not actually, cause this, the, again, this is the pre everything's gotta be live all the time. You guys did a taping in white plains, New York for Monday night raw on November 29th, 1993. And on this mat, on this show, you're going to wrestle PJ Walker, who we know is going to become Aldo Montoya and just incredible. It's your TV debut but it doesn't actually air first, but it is your Monday night raw debut. You get a win with the DDT in four minutes and nine seconds. Uh, why the DDT? Why is that the, uh, the move you're going to go with? They just, uh, I think it was, yeah, use it because I was up for anything. I, I know that the, me being a heel, I know the drop kick was potentially going to be a finish, but I'm like, no, I use that all the time. Um, but going back on the 12 vignettes, that was another thing that I had, you know, when I hear like they're going to run 12 weeks or I counted the weeks or whatever. And I remember Bruce telling me, no, we're going to do compilation videos. And Kerwin's got this thing put together where, um, you know, he put all 11, but they spliced them up and took a little bit from one vignette and a little bit from another, but told the story again, going back to just how in how, how much of a platform it, you know, it was, it's so cool. But PJ, I remember, uh, first time I met him, I mean, I was young, but he was really young. He's like 20 years old here, 21, uh, but super athletic. Um, but the DDT, uh, I, I think it's just something that, uh, the, the, the agent said, just, just go with it. I didn't ask questions. What sort of finish were you using in Memphis? Drop kick, uh, a lot. Um, you know, isn't it, isn't it weird to say these words out loud? What was your finish drop kick? Yeah, well, and, 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 you know, Lawler used the pile driver, but it was like barred. So having a finish in Memphis wasn't necessarily like it is today. Like, oh, what's your finish? Oh, no, uh, I get that it's a different business. I'm just saying these days, you know, we got to oh, do a 630 into a tombstone, yeah, yeah, backwards, yeah. inverse, double reverse, Fernum Schnavitz. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Different era. Um, your first match, uh, or, or I should mention you do wind up doing your next match that winds up on TV is against Scott Taylor, who we know is going to go on to be Scotty too hottie. It's a wrestling challenge, uh, episode that's recorded in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts that's at the civic center. There's 4,000 fans in attendance there on November 30th, but the first match that actually makes air is in fact a superstars taping. And it airs on December 18th, the week before Christmas, 1993, you get a win over Chris Duffy in uh, Utica, New York at the war Memorial, 4,500 fans there, but you're off and running, man. But what a, what a setup you have to where before you ever walk out in front of a live crowd, they've seen your rap on TV over and over and over and over. And by the time it actually airs on TV, cause we started this in September. Uh, and now here we are, you know, a week before Christmas, man, people hated your freaking guts. It worked. It works. Look, and I have been in, you know, you, you name a town, uh, Louisville, Evansville, Memphis, or any territory town when new talent would come in, you know, and a heel walk through the curtain and the people just didn't know him. So other than sort of a, a smattering of a few boos that, okay, he walked through the hill side, we're supposed to boo him. There was basically no reaction, but literally when, when the, when the music hit and, and you could feel the audience like, just like 
react in, in, in a, okay, here comes this asshole type deal. And then going through the curtain and they're like, Hey, we want you to strut a little bit, but I, I, I just didn't have that groove down on like how I was going to walk to the ring because strutting all the way to the ring would take way too long. Um, but, but man, it, yes, it worked and it worked in a big way and I knew it. And, um, I, I think it was Springfield. I remember Vince pulling me aside and, and like, and basically saying, I really like the direction this is going. I want to mention, we've, we've mentioned all the guys you're getting wins over here, basically enhancement talent, not trying to be ugly or dismissive, but December 1st, when you record your, your television debut match with Chris Duffy for superstars, the next day you're in San Diego, California, and you're working with Bret Hart. Of course, Brett's on the A side, but still December 4th, you're in Anaheim at the Arrowhead pond, 6,400 people. You're working with Brett in the main event and they give you 17 minutes and 50 seconds. Uh, the ne very next day you're in San Fran, the cow palace, not exactly a sellout 2,600 fans, but still you're working with Brett Hart. A week later, you're in, uh, Austin, Texas, Brett's working with Jeff Jarrett. Uh, the big boss man is a special guest referee. It's, it's amazing to me that if we're on TV, you're getting a win and you're, you're working with enhancement talent, but if we're on the road, you're working with Brett as we wind up the year, 1993, you're in Saginaw, Michigan, the day after Christmas, you get a win over Marty Jannetty. The next day you're in Toledo, Ohio. You get a win over Virgil the following day, the 28th, you get a win over the one, two, three kid on, uh, the 20 or the 30th, rather again, in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, a win over the one, two, three kid, and you'll finish out the year, December 31st, Williamsport, Pennsylvania, yet another win over the one, two, three kid. Uh, this is, uh, as much as I hate it and don't want to admit it, man, this is how you debut a character vignette after vignette after vignette. Let's make them hate him. Everything about him is hateable heat all over the place. Give him a lot of easy wins on TV. And then let's put him on the road with top talent in the freaking main event with Bret Hart. And then let's let him pick up some wins over some names. Fans in 93 knew who Marty Jannetty was. They knew who the one, two, three kid was. They were familiar with Virgil and, uh, you're on the A side every time you gotta be feeling pretty good about yourself as we wind down 93. Oh, you think? And, and two things that jumped off when you were going through the uh, live events, uh, I think you left one out if I recall, cause I was, you know, again, I'm coming from the territories and next thing, you know, I'm doing raw and superstars and challenge. And then I'm flying to do San Diego. I think we did San Diego. Um, San Francisco, Honolulu, back to LA. I think that was the four day loop. And we didn't get a hotel room in Honolulu because we landed, went to Gold's Gym, ate good or ate good, went to Gold's Gym, had another meal, went and worked the show, um, went uh, to uh, somewhere, drank some beer, and got back on a flight and flew back into LA. Uh, that was that loop against Brett and, you know, Brett always worked snug. I loved it. Uh, those were some of my, well, they were some of my first heel matches with, 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 uh, you know, 17 minutes with Brett and one of my first matches a heel. That was a great education for me. Uh, and then that's that next loop. Uh, what, you know, what, which is look, I, I know things have come and gone. I'd never worked on new year's Eve in my life and I'm in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, on new year's eve and yeah. we started early uh and so uh i remember i was with janetti and, and some other folks but anyway uh interesting times way back when before we uh get out of here i wanted to play the uh the audio from your very first match uh in the wwf that's going to air on tv by the way that match you were talking about uh honolulu i don't I don't show, I don't have the records of that match to show who I was on it. I believe you're on it. I know Brett and Owen were on it, uh, yeah. but it's on uh, December 8th. Uh, but that would have been uh, around the same time that we saw guys working internationally as well. Either way, a lot to unpack here, but I do have uh, the audio here queued up. And I think Shawn Michaels is even on commentary. We're going to play it here from your match against Chris Duffy. You've got a promo involved as well, which is why we're going to. 
Go ahead, that's it. Ludwig Borga. He eliminated Tatanka from the Survivor Series and dealt a crushing blow. Borga. Ladies and gentlemen, on Monday Night Raw, Tatanka against Ludwig Borga. Ludwig Borga. However, WWE fans over in Port Jervis, New York. Chris Looking forward to the Duffy. World Wrestling Federation fundraising event, the funds of which will benefit the Fort Jervis High School Student Council. And on hand, Thursday night, January 6th in Fort Jervis, New York, will be the Undertaker. Well, it's right there. And this man is oozes confidence. Yeah, that may not be the only thing he uses. Look at that outfit. Jeff, you have on the stupidest looking outfit of all time. Thank you, Conrad. Appreciate it. I, I believe it's been described by Eric Bischoff as a dick dancer outfit. I'm colorblind, but I think it's like orange and purple and, uh, got the stripes across the chest and this weird thing dangling from your arm. It's really bad. Awful. Right. Here we go. Jarrett. Well, we know how to spell the name. No question of that. Jeff Jarrett making his debut. Obviously the winner of many spelling bees, and I for one looking forward <laughs> to seeing him show his stuff. Yeah. What's that? That's Stan Lane. Oh, you're it's exactly right. That's exactly who it is. Oh, here's the insert. What does Double J want for Christmas? Well, let's get something straight right from the start. Whatever Double J wants, he takes. Christmas. <laughs> the WWF? I don't think so. The Double JF sounds much, much better to me. Don't you think? <laughs> oh, my goodness. This guy's too much. Drop kick by Jeff Jarrett. And Double J all So you, you didn't quite yet have your, your strut routine like you like it. But this gear that I'm making fun of, that's so awful. Uh, is this something that you and the wife made in the basement as well? It, why do you have to throw the basement in there? The framing of it. I, I'm, 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 I'm candidly, I'm, I'm, I'm very hurt that Eric would refer to it. No, <laughs> no. So it, as I, again, uh, flamboyance, um, over the top, um, sure. The, the, the whole vibe and, 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 uh, I had worn this in Memphis. Uh, I don't know if it was, I was trying this out. Uh, but when I knew that I was going to be going to the WWF and maybe even before that, cause I was doing some things in Memphis and trying different things. I was always a big believer in character development long before double, you know, cause the King was such a character and the fabs and the rock and roll express and uh dirty Dutch Mantel and the sheep herders and PYTs. I mean, I could go with Jimmy Hart, the first family. We were always about characters, always in Memphis, the moon dogs. Uh, so I was trying different things, but that, the DDT, uh, another DDT, but you know, do it right there. The, 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 the five straps in front, three straps in back. It's just a different look, a different vibe, but knowing with the Porter Wagner esque and the over the top singing cowboy. Hang this, on one second. You got the mic again. Wait, it's the old double J, and it's the truth. And when I get done with the WWF, I'm going to remake it, baby. And everybody knows what it's going to be called. It's going to be called the Double J. Ha ha, I love it. Well, a rather auspicious uh, debut there by Double J. We'll be right back with more. So you had a little promo, you know, uh, coming in before and after a little bit of mic work, but at the same time, uh, they do give you the little insert treatment. You get the little picture in a picture promo and, uh, you got to do a strut, a modified Fargo strut. I guess we'll talk about that and, uh, show off your, your finishing maneuver, but right in the middle of the match, you rub Duffy's face into the canvas. Not something you see a lot of in that era, but man, that's heat. Everything about you, dude is hateable. Uh, I see why so many of our listeners, myself included, just hated your freaking guts, dude. My goodness. Um, I loved it when, when putting it in context, I mean, having a guy talk live outside of Vince or his color commentators, uh, just didn't happen in those days. Very, yeah. very few. I'll just say very few, not it didn't happen, but, um, 
boy, I was getting the green light because, um, you know, and I thought about this, uh, not specifically then, but as the years went on, Bruce was such a big part in, uh, giving Vince confidence, like no Vince, I've worked with him, no Vince, he could do this or, Hey, why don't we do this? And you know, Vince, I can't stand this guy. He's so detestable, but just that whole character development and Vince seeing it. And then the other agents were always coming up to me and, you know, giving different input and all that. We just really started off, um, God on the right foot on so many different avenues, Kerwin, in his development and, and how they were going to shoot things. Just like I said, at the top of the episode, it, these were some really fun times. Were you already doing the, um, the, the Fargo strut in Memphis, or is that something you, you brought, you borrowed here for the national scene? No, I mean, only like at certain times would we like do a high spot with it, but not every week you know, doing a strut here and there, Lawler would do a strut here and there, but you had to have the right heel to tee it up. The heel would have to do something to you and, and he would do some kind of goofy strut or some type of mocking. It was the whole setup. So I had touched on it, uh, often, but not regular. Like, like I knew that I was going to insert into this character because the strut, and again, I grew up, Jackie Fargo's was, you know, uh, I love Lawler, but, but I was, got the opportunity to be around him. Fargo was like my childhood idol. Let's, uh, let's go to your Monday night raw debut. Again, this is two days after superstars, uh, Stan Lane was on commentary there. Sean Michaels is actually the guest commentator for Monday night raw. I got those backwards, but let's take a listen to your Monday night raw debut here. Two days later, December 20th, 1993. Exactly. Although I did see one once on Michael Jackson, or was it Latoya? I'm not really sure. You can hardly tell either one apart. So, uh, I guess maybe the British so a very young PJ Walker with hair there. Uh, <laughs> so this is the the match that was actually taped first, but it's going to air two days after. Oh, and you're on the mic again. Tennessee. There must be something wrong with the way he sings. Unable to get a break in Music City, USA. Oh, come on, come on, come on. And now, this man claims he's going to use the World Wrestling Federation to catapult himself to stardom and then go back to Nashville. First of all, the country and western industry is so crooked right now. They got Double J right under their nose and they don't want to use him. Why? They're jealous. I can understand what he's going through. What do you know about country and western music, John Michaels? I'm from Texas. Yeah, you're, so you're from Texas, all right. Country and western. All the way. So uh, you've got your, your white outfit on here, and you had some fur on your shoulders, and you got fringe on your legs. This is quite a look here. Your referee for this first match here against uh, what's, who's going to become just incredible, PJ Walker, is uh, Gino's son. And. Uh, Man, he left oh, he it way, way, way too soon, but it, here you are on Monday night raw and you heard the, uh, the iconic introduction from Howard Finkel. Is that one of those little moments where you realize as a kid who grew up watching WrestleMania and SummerSlam, man, Howard Finkel saying my name, I made it. I used to love it at the garden or Meadowlands or wherever Howard was at just iconic. Um, he'd always joke with me, double J, what are you weighing these night tonight? And just as a joke, you know, but, uh, yeah, me and Fink hit it off from day, literally from day one. He was so kind to me. Uh, you know, those days he would watch the tapes of Memphis. He was the guy in the office that sort of aggregated what was going on in promotions outside of, um, 
of, of the current uh, scene in WWF. So Howard knew of my work uh, and was so complimentary. Was the plan to always start the, the show and end the show with you on the mic? You mean the match? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, they, they, they again, the, the Vince McMahon and, and the mindset of personal branding and ingraining the character and the spelling of the name. And it, like you said, it's detestable. They hated it. People hated it. Here's a guy spelling his own name over and over and over. Not a lot to like, like about that, but yes, that was sort of the, um, and in, in, in house shows or excuse me, in, in live events, uh, I would elaborate even further, but always talk before and after. You can call them house shows here on the podcast. We know what you mean. <laughs> I do. I was giving you, uh, tell me up about the transition from the DDT to the figure four. Do you remember when you made that move? No. And, and I don't even remember exactly why, uh, other than, um, you know, I don't know if anybody was using the DDT and the DDT. A lot of times you, the, the opponent has to take it right. Um, but, uh, getting into a submission and I don't know if that, I just don't recall like what was Vince had to approve it, but I don't know if it was a, a an agent or me or connection or whatever it may be. The first time I see you win with that based on my research is wrestling challenge. It's a taping on April 28th in Springfield mass. And you just recently said, I remember talking to Vince in Springfield, hmm. picked up a win over a win over Mike Davis in a minute and 55 seconds. And you won with the figure four during the bout is when doing the clown would cut an insert promo on you. Uh, so yeah, the figure four, the first time I see you win with it on TV or at all that I can see is, uh, is there interesting and of course in early 94 we're going to talk about it another time you make your madison square garden debut and boy the big moments continue but now you're a part of the big time i'd be remiss if i didn't ask about the thing that everybody surprised you talk about uh how were your first payoffs in the wwf was it did it exceed or meet your expectations gosh i've got pretty good recall on specifics uh and and most of the time tell me a dollar amount i'm just saying do you remember being happy oh yeah i mean that's what i wish i what i'm saying is heck i don't mind sharing i wish i remember but yeah hell yeah i was very excited um yes i mean very excited um tvs you didn't make any money um let's listen to this he was wonderful i was there So chat me up. Uh, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but I wanted people to hear that because you're laying the groundwork for what is going to become the whole roadie angle, but that can't be the plan just yet, or at least not with Brian, because he's doing jobs on WCW TV and working, working with Smoky mountain. Did you know that was the payoff all along or was it just, Hey, we're going to stretch this thing out forever of he's the fantastic singer who never sings. We were headed in that direction, knowing it out. Well, it was my impression and my understanding that we're going to sort of figure that out as we go, because, you know, uh, look, even if I sang, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, it's still singing. It, it was the character development of, Nashville and, you know, I'm going to rename the WWF and rename the country music hall of fame. It's just that we were heading that direction, but there wasn't, you know, the roadie wasn't even thought of in, in early 94. Uh, and you just referenced, I think doink was the very first storyline that I entered into. Let my family save your family some cash. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket, but we will save you money. It's not a matter if. It's a matter of how much save with Conrad.com. We got tons of questions about your uh, debut here. Ain't I great. There's no way we'll get to them all. Let's do a few here. Uh, Ian wants to know, I'd like to know Jeff's relationship with gorilla monsoon. And if he was aware that gorilla would take shots at his father, Jerry Jarrett on commentary in early squash matches. I have to admit, Jeff, I didn't know about this myself until a few years ago. When Bruce started to really have some fun at your dad's expense, talking about the rumor and innuendo that your dad was essentially going to run the WWF. Supposedly, uh, gorilla was with, uh, Pat and Bruce and thinking 
that perhaps your dad was a threat to their position within the company. And the theory is that gorilla would take some shots at dear old dad. Whenever you were wrestling, did you hear that? what did you think of that? I didn't remember hearing it on commentary, but me and gorilla always had a really good relationship. He, uh, I'm going on what, what he told, he, he liked my work. Um, yeah. and, and, and he would come up and give me pointers. Um, and about, uh, you know, after I do a move, uh, sell it, look into the camera, look right off camera, do this, do that. He said, let us, let us feel the story about you. You don't have the mic. He would give me pointers and man, he was so cool with me on, on those type deals. So, um, and again, the, uh, I wasn't aware of the, the, the pot shots, whatever, but he also, uh, once you got to know him again, I didn't have any point of reference of gorilla monsoon other than, um, him and by me, made a great team you know, knowing his, I wasn't around him in his in-ring days. Uh, I didn't know that he was, uh, such a, uh, really good, uh, we'll call it office guy that, you know, he was a part of ownership, the businessman of gorilla, but so coming in there, I'm thinking of him as a play by play guy first, but once you got to know him and talk to him and him pull me aside and he, I kind of remember he'd, you know, he'd say, come here. And he would sit down on a road case and take his glasses off. And we would have like wrestling talks, like student teacher, uh, th those kind of conversations. So, um, which was so cool to me that, that, you know, here's this guy and, Gorilla was so articulate. Obviously, people heard him on air, but but backstage, um, he took the time to take me under his wing and and give me some pointers in a such a refreshing way. Uh, it was really cool, really really cool. But I, I don't remember any of the, the the shots. Handful more questions here. Joe wants to know: as someone who knew you through the magazines, I love seeing folks like Miss Texas and Ronnie P. Gossett in your debut videos. Was there anyone you tried to get in that was rejected? No, I mean, sort of the, 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 the thing that I wanted to see happen. And I had seen this through the years in Memphis was not all four of them at one time, but somebody to play off of, obviously Rody came to fit that bill, but whether it's my driver, whether it was my promoter, whether it was my secretary, you know, whether it was, um, somebody I could play my step and fetch somebody that I'm this country music star. Remember we're early nineties. And if you think about early nineties and, and, and music, not just rap or country, no such thing as country and Western, but I guess there was, but anyway, you know, seeing the entourages, if you will, now it's commonplace with athletes or actors or whatever. Um, but no, those four could all work. You know, they could all take bumps. Um, and so that was sort of the, the, the underlying theme. Uh, but no, we, there wasn't anybody that we didn't get really fun question here. Can't wait to hear your answer. Ted, the hillbilly heel wants to know when you first arrived did any talent pull you to the side and say, now be sure to do this or don't do that. Hmm. When they're trying to just sort of show you the ropes or give you the heads up the Iggy after, as they say, did anybody say, Ooh, Jeff, be careful not to do this or that. Well, Having a agent at every live event, I can remember having those conversations, whether it was Sean or Savage or I, I, you know, I can't put my thumb on it, but that was new that you're going to go out and work a, a match. And when you come through the curtain, you're, you're going to have a discussion about the match in Tennessee. Um, if the discussion did take place, it was one, two, three minutes. And then, you know, on to the next night. Um, but I don't remember any recall in any recollection of that. Um, you know, it's a different era, different time, but nothing jumps off the page. Uh, Podfather fan wants to know who are you most eager to work with? Oh gosh. Sean's at the top of the list. Uh, just because of the matches that I'd had in Tennessee Savage goes without saying Brett, um, Kurt was hurt at that time. If I recall. Uh, perfect. The back back situation. But those would have been the big four. Yeah. Uh, here's one from Midway Heel. When you came to the WWF, who was your crew? Who did you ride with? And did you have a mentor? Oh, I, I Savage would be up there on mentor. Um, but you know, 
from the very beginning, it was um, Kevin, Scott, Sean. It's interesting to, uh, to go back and, and take a look at this. And uh, I don't know. I think there's a new appreciation for the new generation in this era of the WWF that almost feels like for a long time it was forgotten. Everybody talked about and celebrated the attitude era. And then we had a whole new set of fans who really got excited about ruthless aggression. Uh, but going back and visiting this was fun, man. And I appreciate you humoring me as we played some of these vignettes and uh, the, anything else you want to share with us about your WWF debut and, and how it all came together? Well, the, that new generation, you know, look, hindsight is always 2020, but the transition that we, that I referenced earlier from the Hulkamania years. And I can't really say that. And I'd love to ask you this question was WCW branded in the, uh, you know, so what was, how would you cache? Hey, what would you call the WCW era from about 85 to about 92, 91? What is that era? Well, I mean, you know, Crockett was, was really the thing until WCW took over. And then there's the herd era right after. Yeah. Uh, and then it would be the bill white stuff. And then it felt like with Bischoff, there was a shift. Yeah. Um, oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, but, but still it was, it's an interesting time in the wrestling business, but of course the WWF, you know, they're sort of the pace car, you know, uh-huh. you and I made the ex- uh, conversation earlier that, you know, some of the other wrestling promotions that are, uh, um, doing really creative and innovative things are a lot of people's favorites, but then sometimes you see the way the WWF does it. And I'm not referencing AEW. I'm saying whether it's impact or it's TNA or it's ECW or it's WCW them at their best, they, they kind of feel like your favorite, you know, dive bar band or your favorite, uh, you know, local band. But then when the WWF is doing their thing, man, it, it feels like a stadium act and it's the production is really the missing piece. And I think that's always been the case. Like the WWF's production, even when WCW was quote unquote, number one, somehow more often than not, the WWF just outproduced them. Would you agree with that? Yeah, Kevin Dunn. I text Kevin the other day. I saw a couple of videos as they were turning to live events. It is, um, you know, as big a college football game, and I love watching college football and college basketball, but I'll specifically say when you see a Super Bowl production, you go, okay, you got World Series, you got Stanley Cup, you got the NBA Finals. But when you see a Super Bowl production, you go, okay, that's the big time. And they're all major. But, but there is a, a, a dividing line in those production values in, in so many ways. And that's, you know, um, I was going to that new generation era, back to the, the, the uh, listener's question. Um, the new generation group of guys that Vince consciously said, Hulkamania run is over. We're going to dig in. And I can remember Savage going, whoa, brother. <laughs> he wasn't a real big fan of the branding of new generation because he knew that he was a part of the Hulkamania era, but, but Vince was going to dig in and Sean and Brett and diesel and razor and me, and you know, that, that different names. And, and you saw how it was, it was going. And this is one of those, what if questions, you know, that, that what if, if that would have continued going and Hogan wouldn't have turned heel. Yeah. Cause that was the, that was, it, it wasn't the attitude era. It, it, in my opinion, it was Hogan switching heel, which catapulted no more new generation. You know, I mean, there's, th- there's different ways to look at it, but that was uh Hogan switching heel was okay. Uh, we thought Hulkamania was dead and gone, but guess what? Here comes this new, you know, obviously Hall and Nash followed and they were a part of the new generation, but, that was the day of the new generation, but the houses that start to came up in Pittsburgh and Baltimore and the garden and out on the West coast, you know, it was the rebuilding of Vince's company. Well, we've had fun talking about this today. Did we get it all? Did we, uh, is, did oh, we break it all down? Here, damn it. What's that? You're running the show here. Don't ask me. Don't chastise me. Do you realize I didn't say that one time today? Not once. <laughs> You should have to let people know it's a new t-shirt over at boxagimmicks.com. Uh, 
listen, I, I do want to give you a chance because you've had a chance to sort of jog your memory the last few days as we got ready to record this episode. Anything else about your debut you want to share? Uh, look, the, the gratitude list goes a mile long. Um, launching my world in May, like I said, and hearing those comment after comment after comment, what an asshole, I didn't like you, I didn't think this, I didn't think that, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then being a promoter and really an executive producer, I'll say that. And looking at, I said it earlier in the uh, episode, the blueprint on character development and how to debut a character and me living it and walking through the curtain and hearing it from day one, man, it, 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 I think there's something to that in today's environment. If you just have a little pay, like anything, Conrad, we're, we're, we're our, our side businesses. We're if you have a little patience in plowing the ground, planting the seed, watering it, giving, having it good soil, um, j just getting it and, and just don't wanting the bloom overnight. If you just take a little time and a little discipline, a little patience, boy, you talk about the old uh, law of reaping and sowing. Um, we, we really sowed a lot of seeds in those first 12 weeks. I'll just say that. Well, we're really appreciative that you guys have joined us. Hopefully you're digging what we're doing. We're going to be back next week and we're going to throw you the keys to the show. It's our very first ever ask Jeff anything. We've got tons of questions, but we're ready for more. Uh, we're going to make this a monster episode because there is so much to talk about with Jeff. Jeff, I've had a blast with you here today, and I'm looking forward to next week. Are you nervous about next week, though? It's not just me asking the questions now, you know. Now, you know what? Talking about all of this and now ask anything, I would be remiss in, in saying that this week, um, the action figure, that retro action figure is going on sale. And um, Matt Cardona, Brad Myers, I, I won't get into the long-winded thing. Just follow my Twitter or the My World Twitter or the ad-free Twitter. We're going to have a special YouTube show that we already did on the ad-free shows. Anyway, it, 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 it's, it, that original uh, action figure came out of it, um, and, and we got so much feedback. And Again, I'm going back. I'm, I'm going a long, way around, a long way around to say you're talking about Ask Anything. When the uh, ad-free team put this out uh, on Twitter to ask all the questions, it was at the same time there was a lot of uh, action figure with zombie sailor toys and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm ready. I'm excited. Uh, the, the, the podcast being launched has opened up so many avenues. Um, it, it's pretty cool. And, and the questions that I already saw online, um, man, it's going to be a fun episode. I'll say that. I, I just, I'm certain of that. If you haven't already go check out zombie sailor on social media. Uh, they're on Twitter and uh, they're making, a Jeff Jarrett figure inspired, uh, by that debut yes. look that he had, what a look, and it's going to be a limited run as with everything else that uh, Cardona and Myers do, it's going to sell out and it's going to sell out fast. So, uh, stay tuned I think it's going on sale this week. Uh, but if you wait until next week to get it, you're probably going to miss it. Uh, so go ahead and get in front of this and snatch it right now. It's zombie sailor on social media, or you can just look for me or Jeff for ad free shows or our podcast. But man, this is, uh, it's fun to go back and revisit the good old days. And now to know that you too can add a little mini asshole, Jeff Jarrett, heat getting gimmick to your shelf at home. <laughs> Thanks to our friends at zombie sailor. Don't forget you get all our shows early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com, including lots of bonus content. And you never know what we've got up our sleeve, but Jeff is, uh, he's a good, uh, he's a good sport about all this. So ask him a question right now on social media. And we'll be back next week with another episode of my world with Jeff Jarrett. Peace. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. So you can notice anytime we upload some new content and go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a fund your loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at savewithconrad.com.